Okay, we're pleased, very pleased to have Linton Garner, uh, whose reputation precedes him with us today. I'm very pleased to have Linton. Welcome, Linton, and thank you very much for participating today. Thank you, uh, Dave. It's, very, it's great to be a part of this uh, process. Well, thank you very much. And what we typically do is we start out with some background questions just to give everybody their own context in, 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 uh, in this process. Okay. So I'm going to start out with some basic stuff. Mm -hmm. For example, where were your parents born? My parents were born in the United States. Uh, my father in North Carolina and my mother in New Jersey. Okay, very good. And where were you born? I was born in New Jersey um, back in uh, 1952 and came to Canada in 1964 with my father and family. Uh, my father was a jazz musician who uh, got opportunities to for work up here in Canada. And uh, we were, he was actually the leader of the house band uh, at Rock Hedge Paradise, which is a famous nightclub here in, in Montreal. And uh, it was the largest, uh, most famous one in Canada at the time. And uh, we were supposed to go back after the contract and we never did. So, uh, you know, I like to tell people I'm a born American socialized Canadian. <laughs> okay, and where did you receive your education, your elementary, your secondary, and any post? Element, my elementary school uh, was in Villa Sal, old Cecil Newman Elementary School, which no longer exists. I went to John Grant High School in Lachine, which also no longer exists. And then I went to Dawson, uh, McGill, and, and then Concordia. Okay, and what is your occupation and what uh, other occupations have you had? Well, uh, well, I suppose most people who have lived as long as I have uh, have had several. Uh, but at the present time, I'm the executive director for the Heritage College Foundation out in Gatineau. Uh, but I had been involved uh, for many years uh, as a community, I guess, person, uh, a community organizer. I worked with lots of, I worked with youth in a number of communities through the YMCA, the old um, University Settlement Community Center, uh, the Kingston Community Center in over in Villa Mard. Um, I've done a lot of work with youth. I even uh, worked at one time for youth protection. Um, but I've really been involved, uh, you know, on a variety of issues, whether it was um, youth um, English rights, um, anti-racism involved, you know, tremendously with the black community over, over the years. I'm a past president of both the Cote you know, Black Community Association and uh, the old uh, Negro Community Center. Um, I've been involved with, you know, a number of organizations uh, within the black community and and as well worked in government over a number of, over a number of years at uh, Ministry of Health and Social Services and organizing uh, access to services in the English language for the English speaking population of the, of the Montreal region. Uh, I worked as um, an intercultural and interracial rela uh, relations advisor to the president, the then president of the, uh, the now defunct uh, uh, MUC, um, the late Vera Denela, and as well, um, I've been a part of a number of, of committees um, that, uh, you know, one of the first uh, intercultural interracial relations committee at the city of Montreal. Um, and I work for the Ministry of Education. I'm a former attache to the, to the former and late Ministry of Education, Mr. Pierre Reed. Uh, and and then worked on the development of what was called the community learning centers um, uh, at uh, the Ministry of Education, uh, which is uh, a, a situation of bringing community inside schools in the English language uh, in, in education network. Uh, and as well, have been involved in many other endeavors in education. I'm, I'm a former commissioner at the Lester B. Pearson School Board, and um, and uh, one of my present projects, along with Dr. Dorothy Williams, I am the co-author of, or co-creator of uh, an educational kit called the ABCs of Canadian Black History, uh, which we are 
uh, actively trying to put into schools across the country to inform people of the history that they don't know. Um, we It's not you know just Black history, it's actually what we subtitled the kit is a journey of discovery into Canadian history, because that's what it is. It's Canadian history. It's just the stories that you haven't been told. Mm -hmm. And so, and as, uh, along the way as well, I've been uh, a basketball coach, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, which I still do here at the Heritage College for the uh, Division II men's team. And uh, I've been active in a number of other uh, areas with, uh, you know, in the community. I am a co-founder of the West Island Black Community Association, which I think is just past its 40th year now. Uh, what done. So I've been very much uh, actively involved with the uh, Black community, the English speaking community as well. I formerly worked for Alliance Quebec as a, as both a community organizer in the southwest area of of the uh, of the city and as a former director of health and social services uh, for for the same organization. Okay, and Linton, where do you live now? I live in Gatineau now, which is where uh, Heritage College is, and uh, I've been doing a number of things out here in this community. Um, I hosted for four years a local uh, television show on the Math TV called uh, City Life, uh, which spoke to the English speaking community. We hope to try to get back there uh, shortly, and have been a co producer of. Let me see now, three different television shows, uh, one involving the uh, the British Hotel, uh, one involving um, the uh, uh, involving a cooking show that was uh, filmed here locally at, at one of the local spas, and then one which was uh, involved with a group out uh, out of Wakefield, uh, Quebec, that organized uh, uh, a sort of documentary of local artists, uh, you know, uh, in the English speaking community throughout the region. Okay, excellent. Well, now, like, like I like to say to everybody, we're going to get into the meat of the matter here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about questions concerning your experience in living in Quebec today. Okay. What is the best thing in your experience about living in Quebec? Well, there are so many things, I think. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, the community in which I've, you know, grown up in, you know, from uh, my start in Villa Salle and in, in the southwest of Montreal, uh, Verdun, Point St. Charles, uh, Lachine, uh, were, were very um, important in the development of my life, the friends that I made there and uh, and the connection that I still seem to, to have there. Um, uh, I still describe myself as a boy from La Salle. Uh, one of the La Salle boys is, is where I played, you know, football, and, you know, and, you know, uh, and it's really had a, just a great time with, you know, with the, uh, with the young people that I grew up with, you know, at the time. So to me, that's a very, you know, been very significant. Um, I think it's, it is home, you know, in, in the sense Quebec is home to me. Uh, you know, I think English speaking Quebecers are different than uh, English speakers in the rest of the country, mainly because of what we, you know, not because of the of the difficulties, but because of uh, of the expanse of things that we've been exposed to, the French culture and uh, having the opportunity to, you know, to move in and out of this city, uh, out of Montreal. Um, you know, has really afforded me a great chance to have a lot of different experiences that I don't think that I would have had somewhere else. And uh, uh, and I've been fortunate, you know, to have had a, a very good life here in Quebec. I mean, and I wouldn't choose really to be living it elsewhere. Now, a lot of people have a difficulty with the next question. I certainly would if somebody asked me this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And you can elaborate if you would answer the question, but and then you're free to elaborate as much as you want. Describe your relationship to Quebec in a single word. Home. 
it's easy for me to, you know, to say that this is who I identify with, mm -hmm. uh, with both aspects of the culture, you know, with, you know, the two cultures here. Um, I speak French, you know, uh, badly, but, you know, uh, no, I think I can, I can speak French and, uh, you know, but, you know, uh, and, you know, I participate in commissions and, you know, uh, studies and, and work for the government, in, you know, in, in Quebec, uh, you know, and so I, you know, I speak the language well, I can get along well. Um, and I, I really just like the, you know, the nature of, of Quebec. And I think I have certainly have enjoyed the idea that the Francophone community uh, at, at, as well has seen itself as different from the rest of the country and, and, is, and that has made itself, you know, plain, uh, uh, you know, on a number of levels, sometimes more pleasant than others to uh, for English speakers, but um, still, uh, there is a certain identification that I have with Quebec that you know um, that uh, I don't think I'll ever lose in my life. Okay, now where do you feel most at home in Quebec? For example, in communities based on language or culture, profession, or a geographic location. I don't have any difficulty with any part of the, you know, of that. You know, I feel at home in both language use because having been a community person all my life, uh, it, certainly throughout my professional career, I've frequently had to work with the Francophone community directly, whether we were doing uh, uh, social housing, welfare rights, um, you know, marching against, you know, anti-racism and so on. I've been a part of organizing committees that develop responses to those kinds of, you know, uh, those kinds of issues right along with the French speaking community. I've been comfortable in Quebec City or in Gaspé or, you know, the townships or, or anywhere because that's where I had to, you know, I had to, you know, to be, to do what I wanted to do. And I've found, you know, the, you know, the French speaking community wherever I've been welcoming. Uh, sometimes they've been distrustful of, of, you know, who I am and what I may represent to them. And sometimes they may be uncomfortable with that, but we've always managed to be able to, you know, to, to you know, to work things out and come to some kind of general agreement, even if we don't share the same point of view. And the next question, a lot of people have trouble with the second part. So I'm going to briefly explain to you. Um, the second part talks about the official definition in Quebec. And it's people say to me, well, according to who? And my answer is whoever or whomever or whatever you perceive to be the official definition as defined, it could be defined by the media, it could be defined by the government, it could be defined by your peers. It's what you perceived or perceive is the official definition of Quebec. So I'll ask the whole question, keeping that in mind, how would you define a Quebecer or Quebecois? And do you think the official definition in Quebec includes you? Well, first of all, I would go back to uh, René, René Levesque, who quoted, and I think in, in his book, An Option for Quebec, that a Quebecer is anybody who wants to live here. And I've always took that to heart, um, that what I have you know, been here, I would describe myself as a Quebecer to other Canadians um, uh, because my sensibilities, my understanding of, uh, 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 you know, part of, of the world in terms of come through the lens of Quebec and the people I've met in Quebec, both English speaking and French speaking. Um, and both of them carry a characteristic of, of Quebecer that I don't think, that, that I think is very different from other provinces, you know, throughout, you know, throughout the country. So um, I would officially define myself as a Quebecer. I, I have stayed here. I married here, raised children here. Um, I've invested myself in this community. Uh, and again, whether they were, you know, whether they're from majority community or not, uh, whether they were, you know, we were talking about, you know, issues of, of poverty or, uh, you know, anti-racism, uh, you know, I've invested my life 
uh, in this community. And so I think that that would, uh, would define me as a Quebecer because I have put my energies and my talents and, and, and my focus into uh, the community that I live in trying to make it a better community for not just for me, but for everybody who is here in Quebec. And so that, you know, no matter the language group, uh, the ethnicity, all right, and the economic position, the gender, I've always worked on uh, issues of trying to be able to make sure that there were, that inequalities were, you know, were being erased or addressed and then hopefully some of the work that I've done has been able to uh, to diminish some of those inequalities and, and bring people to and the community to an awareness of the presence of, of others and some of the issues that are impacting French and English speaking Quebecers alike. Okay, well, uh, that leads me into the next question, which is, has your sense of identity as a Quebecer or Quebecois changed over the years? And if so, what ways? Well, I think, I mean, at first, when I first arrived, I mean, being a young young person of 11, didn't know much about the, the linguistic realities of Quebec. And I, I, you know, I certainly identified with the English speaking community as, a, you know, uh, and mainly more as Canadian than Quebec, if you know what I mean. But I think uh, over time, I didn't, I have not lost the sense of being Canadian, but I've understood that there are, there are many truths. And a part of those truths are that at times I identify as an Amer as American, uh, always as a black person, um, at times as a Canadian, and at times as a Quebecer. Um, and I think all of those are me. And uh, and so uh, it, it sometimes it depends on the context where I'm in. Not that I would change for either one or the other. I think I'm pretty constant. But you have that. At, at times you feel, depending on the situations you're in, that, you know, that you are uh, more Canadian, you know, than, than anything else, or at times, you know, uh, and I think equally at times, you know, uh, more black than anything else, uh, which is usually the most occasion, and then certainly as Quebecer, uh, more than anything else, you know, at, at times, because of, you know, working with people outside of the region, outside of Quebec, it's always been necessary to try to, to give people a better understanding of what it means to be in Quebec uh, and what the real life here is in Quebec is, rather than what they may have heard on the news or, you know, or any other kinds of impressions. Okay, and that leads me into the next question, which is, what are some of the most difficult things from your perspective about living in Quebec? Well, I think that I, I think I would start with some recent uh, recent events where there are two things that I was uh, not particularly enamored with in, in terms of uh, how Premier Legault expressed himself. Um, the first one being that he said that his primary job as a Premier of Quebec was to preserve the French language. And my understanding of the primary job of a premier or prime minister or any elected official is to look after the welfare of all of its citizens. All right, so, uh, you know, from that standpoint, you know, I was concerned and disturbed about that issue. Uh, and not that I don't think that there's any merit to the idea of protection of the French language, just because I think that uh, and I think what we've subsequently seen coming from the Legault government is that um, there is uh, a, a, a sense of that we as a community of the English speaking community are an afterthought. The second one that was disturbing was that um, Premier Legault said that there is no systemic racism in mm -hmm. And um, and somehow that you know Quebec is an exception to the world, and certainly an exception to the 
uh, I guess the overwhelming experience of people of color in North America. Um, and that somehow Quebec is this little, you know, safe haven where, you know, uh, minorities, and I guess we've always heard before about how, you know, you know how the English community is the, is the best treated minority in the world. Um, but um, the idea that they would feel that there is nothing systemic about the racism that uh, people of color experience, uh, you know, on a daily basis in this in this province doesn't exist. Um, really, is, is you know being uh, the ostrich with his you know head in the sand. Yeah, and to drill down on that even further. My next question is, in recent years, Quebec's francophone majority has identified a number of linguistic and cultural threats. Which of these do you share and support? And which of these concerns make you feel excluded or targeted? Well, look, you know, certainly I would understand from uh, a seminal point of view and, a, and a, an integral point of view uh, that people would be concerned about the continuance of the French language in, in North America. Um, and, and and I understand that that overall feeling on the part of uh, you know born French speakers uh, in, in this province. Um, however, um, what I always understood, and I think as we were always raised, and for most of us were, is that sort of two wrongs don't make a right, uh, in the sense that whatever people have perceived as as a, as a wrong that's being done to them in terms of a French speaking community, um, we 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 seem to feel, and I, I certainly I have felt at times that the uh, that English speaking Quebecers have uh, been, you know, punished in some way, you know, because of the past, and 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 that you know that goes from, and and really that means that in terms of a public face in Quebec, the English speaking community has not, and that. Uh, its institutions, uh, from which we were told by former premiers and other uh, French leaders, uh, French uh, Quebec leaders, about the issues of the, in the language issue. Um, and when we were told that if I were you, I would preserve our institutions, we are starting to see those institutions being eroded. And, um, and I think that's troubling not only for the English speaking community, but I think it's troubling for all of Quebec because certainly what we have added as a community to the development and the life and the culture of Quebec, uh, you know, uh, would be would be sorely missed and and certainly would have uh, made Quebec a very different place if we hadn't you know been a part of this. Uh, some may argue, well, hey, that might be a good thing. But you know, I think there would be something missing from its soul, and, and uh, uh, because I think it really has been uh, the contributions of both communities that have made Quebec what it is today, and um, and certainly um, as a part of that, and sort of referring to the you know the former question about Mr. Legault, uh, you know, part of that has been. That, that you know, uh, both for the French speaking and English speaking community, uh, they haven't always included the minority communities within them, and uh, you know that has been a part of the reality too. That we that minorities, for instance, have been caught between this notion of two founding peoples when we know about the presence of the indigenous community here before the communities arrived, and certainly uh, with the presence of the Black community that's been here uh, since Samuel Le Champlain. So, you know, within that context, uh, 
those are some of the things that I feel I'm the uneasiest about and don't like and uh, would like to be to have those addressed more significantly than we have seen. Uh, and as you know, uh, and if, even if we were just talking about the issue of health and social services, when the former Premier Bouchard uh, came to the Centaur Theater, I was there, and where he announced that when you go to a hospital, you go for a blood test, not a language test, you know, um, in part of his famous speech at the time. Those kinds of, you know, uh, those kinds of sentiments have not been followed up on. And it's certainly those are promises that have not been delivered to the industry. You know, we continue to struggle and we'll struggle further now with Bill 96 uh, to receive services in English. And uh, and that infects, you know, all of you know, all of us in the English speaking community. I think Bill 21, in terms of the pre for the presence of you know minorities and people of color, uh, you know, all of these. Uh, bills that seem to be repressive and have excluded us as part of the definition of Quebecers who deserve full access to all of the rights that are accorded to uh, the French speaking population. Okay. Now, I think you can recognize that some of these questions uh, come at the same idea from a different angle. So, having said that, I'll ask you the next question at the risk of you already answering it. <laughs> is what is the biggest problem facing Quebec today and how in your mind do you think it could be resolved? Well, I think the one of the, I think the major uh, threat is how will it face the future? Um, because we know that the world is changing and it seems like Quebec wants to regress in a certain way. Uh, in terms of returning to its little petite patois, uh, and only thinking of that as the as as what you need to preserve, instead of you know trying to understand what's coming down the pipe and how uh, and how are we preparing, particularly our young people, for the future. Um, we we know that you know, and as you asked before about a little bit about what the threats to Quebec are. Well, I think mainly all you have to do is pick up your cell phone, all right? The world is at your fingertips in your cell phone with right? all the different platforms that you can get out there from Facebook to Instagram to Pinterest to, you know, uh, you know to Google, to whatever. Uh, it brought the world right into Quebec and no longer is it, you know, uh, isolated. And, uh, the young people are trending towards understanding and dealing with that world that's coming into their, you know, into their, uh, into their phones and, and at their fingertips. I don't think the government and the, and the older, you know, francophone community really understands that and, and will, and it's certainly not preparing, you know, themselves for what, you know, what some of those eventualities will be. Um, I do remember that when Philip Cuyal, uh, the former premier, uh, presented himself before the Conseil de Patronats Quebec, he got slapped on the wrist, you know, by them because the business leader said, listen, you are not preparing our French speaking uh, students uh, to speak English well enough in order to compete on the on the international market, uh, you know, uh, both the digital world and the insurance world, which are big industries in, in Quebec City, uh, they're saying they can't find enough English speakers to be able to, uh, you know, respond to the needs and to the demand. And, and I think we've recently seen there's been a pushback on the part of the business community around Bill 96. Um, because they feel that they're sort of almost cutting off their nose to spite their faces, you know, as the old expression. Um, and I'm not, you know, I am not aware of all the nuances of what the business community say, but I understand that, you know, the most prepared people right, to face the future in Quebec are going to be the young English speakers who speak both French and English and who go anywhere in the world 
you know, to ply their trade. And in fact, it's one of the other dangers that's facing Quebec is the brain drain of English speaking young people. Um, but not only a danger to the English speaking community in terms of us being able to continue our presence, but the, you know, uh, but what the economic cost of that is to the future of Quebec, uh, you know, we can only speculate, but certainly with the exodus of some of the best and the brightest, all right, certainly is not gonna hurt, certainly is not gonna help the development of, you know, of Quebec as, you know, as, uh, as a province and as an economic entity. Okay, the next question, I'm gonna preface it a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask you before I ask you the next question, have you had an opportunity to see Guy Rogers' uh, documentary, What We Choose to Remember? Yes, yes, I was a part of that actually. Oh, okay, well, um, in that, he used a very effective visual tool, which I'm gonna use in my next question, which is a show of fingers. So on a scale of one to 10, one being weak, 10 being very strong, how strongly do you feel that the joys of living in Quebec outweigh the challenges? I'm gonna I'm gonna put that probably as an eight. Okay, fair enough, Linton. That's great. Um, now. Is there anything else that you would like to say about your sense of identity or belonging in Quebec? Well, look, I've always been a very confident person, I think. Um, and so I, I am very comfortable in my own skin. And part of that has been because of my experience in growing up here in Quebec. Um, so uh, I, I never feel uh, embarrassed because I'm an English speaker, or I never feel shy because I'm from the black community and I only I may only see myself around the table, you know, as you know, uh, I might be the only one. Um, I, I'm certain that my my family has raised me with, you know, with very strong values and sense of self as well at the same time. And I feel that I can move easily within any component within, you know, uh, you know, Quebec society. So my sense of identity uh, is wrapped firmly around my experience as, a, as uh, living in Quebec. And so therefore I haven't described myself, like I said, with in the rest of Canada as a Quebecer, um, because I strongly identify with, uh, with you know, uh, the values, you know, some of the values of, of Quebec. And like within any society, um, you know, um, there are certain issues, certain barriers uh, that we that we face, depending on the communities that we come from. Um, but I have still chosen to be here. I've still chosen to raise my family. My children are still here, even though they're married and you know, in their late twenties and early thirties, and and now I've started a, you know, a third, you know, generation, you know, of you know, of the Garner family, you know, here in Canada. So, uh, you know, my sense of uh, self uh, is strongly tied to my experience here in in Canada uh, and here in Quebec, uh, as well as you know my my roots in terms of my you know black culture that I was raised in within within my family and all those combined have made me feel very comfortable wherever I am. And, uh, and, and I do use this foundation that helped establish me here uh, in, you know, in Quebec and, and gave me the, uh, the roots I needed to, you know, to grow up uh, are firmly uh, rooted in this Quebec society. Hey, Lyndon, uh, this concludes the official part of the interview. I want to thank you very much for your insight. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this, everybody's story is valid. Yours is certainly no exception, and uh, you brought great insight into what we're trying to do, and I thank you very much for your participation. 
So I'm going to stop the recording right now.